Hello everyone, uh, whenever you watch this, whenever it's uploaded to YouTube, this is the second Christian Truth or Apologetics podcast, and uh, today I have my friend Deflating Atheism with me, but uh, before we get to him, we're going to be talking about truth, and uh, things that pertain to that, and how that relates to Christianity. So, uh, DA, uh, Rob the Deflator, as some people would call you, why don't you tell us who you are, even though most, subscri- most of my subscribers would know who you are and uh what will be coming towards your channel in the future yes well uh uh, thank you yes uh i am uh deflating atheism and i have a youtube channel that that's kind of uh about deflating atheism it's not even really about uh apologetics per se it's just taking uh uh you know things that come to us through social media or the mainstream media or entertainment or, or or even even philosophers, even dime store philosophers, and just kind of dissecting it because most atheism just doesn't hold up. So uh, there really hasn't been much on my channel recently uh, due to personal issues, but uh, hopefully that will change uh, in the future. Do you have any uh, future projects coming up? I have another collaboration with with Missing the Mark, and uh, uh, that should be fun. And uh, otherwise, like, the big projects will probably have to wait at least a month. But, yes, I have, I have like, 200 videos on my channel uh, right now. So, oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say I have 200 videos planned out. It's just, like, while you're oh. way more ahead than I am. I have I have about two dozen videos planned out, but that's that when I finally get around to it. Yeah. I have, like, I will admit I have, like, 200, you know, video ideas, but uh, I haven't really planned them out yet. I'm thinking yeah. about... Uh, yeah. I just did a paper on the martyrdom of the apostles, 19 pages. Uh, surprisingly, I got an A on it, so I'm going to turn that into a video series. And so, excellent, and excellent. Yeah, and uh, I, I've noticed that there's not too much apologetics into that. Uh, Sean McDowell is like uh, the most talked about when it comes to that because his dissertation is on that. But uh, we're not talking about the martyrdom of the apostles. This podcast, we're talking about truth. So, uh, how would you define truth? <laughs> Jeez, that's that's a whopper to uh to uh, 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 put on me. I I uh I don't know. Uh, uh I guess I guess it would have to be uh uh geez. I was going to say correspondence between a uh, uh, belief and reality, but but even that doesn't really hold up, you know. Well, um, a correspondence correspondence to belief and reality, epistemology. That that would seem to be more of the justification of epistemology, but Truth, I, I think you you are right to use the correspondence theory of truth, that which corresponds to reality, whatever reality is. Um, we have limited knowledge, obviously, so we can't know specifically what, with absolute certainty, the Cartesian sense of certainty, what reality is and what truth is. We know that there is something true out there. Uh, and, you know, Anselm, I love his argument against relativism, where, uh, you know, even if nothing existed, it would still be true that nothing existed. So even yes, th- even yes. then, truth would still exist. And uh, that would be sort of the metaphysics of uh, truth, that no matter what, whatever truth is, it can't be what it is not, and that's sort of the law of no- non-contradiction. Now, epistemology, yeah. we don't have absolute certainty, so it's up to debate on how we can discover what is true and what we think is true. But a relativism would seem to say that some beliefs. Well, well I, I have a. Uh, when you say uh, uh, we can't have absolute certainty, you you kind of have to bracket that claim. You know, you know, within within a certain context, we can't yeah. have absolute certainty. Well, like things w- that we see with our senses. Uh, that's yeah. not, that's a posteriori reasoning. I think by definition, you that's induction, and you can't at all have absolute certainty. Yeah. I think I, I think it could still be knowledge as a justified true belief, but uh, if knowledge has to be has to have standards of you know Cartesian certainty, then I don't think we can almost have knowledge about anything besides the laws of logic and our own existence, and that we actually experience something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in, in the you know you know Cartesian uh, cogito. But uh, uh, just before we get too far afield, I just want to say uh, the problem with kind of the correspondence theory, and I haven't really gotten that deep into it, is that, yes, it is possible to to believe the right thing for the wrong reason. So that makes uh, uh, that as a, as a justification for, for 
you know, truth or true knowledge a, a little bit problematic. Well, I, I think what you're talking about is more along the lines of epistemically, you know, I can be wrong about what I think is true or believe what well, I think yeah. you're saying there, believe what is true, but based on wrong reasons, that would be my own epistemology, and that doesn't necessarily determine okay. metaphysics. Okay. Our gotcha. metaphysics really determines our epistemology because we are reasoning from what we perceive and so on, or experience, whether it be the self, which you were talking about before with Descartes and so on, or uh, what we experience in science and our senses and so on. Because uh, I think if it comes from the mind and outwards, corresponds, you, you sort of get into this anti-realism where we don't really know what is true and really truth comes from our own minds and so on. This is where relativism comes in, that truth is really dependent upon the perceiver and what they want to believe in. Sort of epistemology determines our metaphysics, if you get what I'm saying there. Mm, but but e even that is not really a, a consistent way of looking at things. <laughs> because because you, you know, you're still you're still building that on on a on a you know kind kind of on a, on a whole foundation of claims about about basically a, a a conscious mind in a world outside of it you know yeah and and that's uh one of the ways I think relativism sort of shoots itself in the face but I won't be fair because I I sometimes do think when people like Frank Turk and uh some apologists. When uh, they say, you know, when when they say relativists say truth, there is no truth. Is that true? That that sort of statement, I I think that's almost a straw man, because no one really believes that there isn't anything that's true. It's just more to, more of the along the lines of metaphysical truths. So uh, religious beliefs are definitely seen as relative. Pluralism proves that, and uh, you get into moral relativism, which I guess we could discuss a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. Well, well. I think then it would be the responsibility of the people who call themselves relativists of, of doing a better job of defining what what exactly it is they believe. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think to be a lover of wisdom, you want to understand someone's position as best as possible. So you you also yeah. have to ask questions like, "What do you mean?" and so on. Yeah. What are your beliefs before you criticize people's beliefs? Uh, I. Yeah, that would be the principle of charity of a. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, of a trying to understand, interpreting someone's beliefs as rationally as possible. I think the principle of charity is. But uh, we before we get more into truth, I think knowledge is important to define and so on, or uh, and how relativism relativism plays in. So sort of I, I, you know, the typical definition is justify true belief. But uh, I think there are other knowledge claims that don't necessarily fall under that, sort of like uh, relational knowledge, knowledge like uh, you know your parents, but in a way, do you have justified true belief as in in the sense of information and just facts? And uh, I, I think knowledge is a bit more than that, but I think th there's three different categories of knowledge, almost like, if you, if you get what I'm saying there with relational knowledge versus... Uh, you know, sort of a mathematical, deductive, and inductive knowledge. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, there's kind of a, uh, you know, uh, what what the Germans call a uh, kennen and wissen, which is kind of knowledge and knowledge of. It's like it's like it's like knowing something versus being familiar with it. If that kind of get, gets in the direction of what you're saying. Yeah, I think it does. Um, what what I'm trying to say is uh. You know, I, I, well, I don't have a girlfriend, but, you know, people who, who are married, they have that relationship. And Christians don't affirm uh, reality as just sort of, you know, a proposition, but rather God no. is the core center of it, who is a mind, who is a personal being, an agent, and so on. And that goes way beyond just a proposition. And, uh, you know, scientism yeah. and the yeah. other worldviews view everything views Positive, everything yeah yeah views everything as having to be propositional knowledge i'm saying that not all knowledge is propositional knowledge because clearly you know your parents they raised you you know uh, a classic example is you know the mother sees the child smiling back when you know the child is first born yeah. and so on just things like that i don't think you can actually put that in propositional phrase 
another type yeah. of knowledge would uh be procedural knowledge would well well then, then, then you got maybe something like qualia where, where it's where it's impossible even to frame it in, in a propositional uh, uh, way you know we we all we all know the color orange but you know it's not it's not you know a true proposition yeah i think i think this is what uh would be intuition immediate knowledge where you just know it but you yeah. can't necessarily justify it by uh you know propositions and when people challenge that you can just bring up examples in their own life you know uh do you know I exist? Well, geez, yeah. if you if you can't put that in a proposition and prove that, then you can't really correct my own epistemology and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, I mean, I mean, you could you could say, you know, does, does JMD exist? Yes, it is true. So, I mean, yeah, you can <laughs> in, in that very trivial sense, you 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 can make it a, a, a propositional claim. You could, but I guess my point would be there's no real to justify that in the propositional way. Like, yeah. you can't really give a but the, but the argument. Experience, but the experience of, of, of seeing you or hearing you or whatever would, would be would be non-propositional. Yeah, and uh, that would be senses too. And I think that would just be another uh, example where, where you sort of have to intuit and accept that as immediate knowledge. Mm, yeah. Now, when it comes in the case of senses, obviously that can easily be wrong. Just with like thought experiments, like uh, you know, the last Thursday experiment was everything created last Thursday. Yeah, the brain and vet and so on. Everything is created with the appearance of age, and uh, that could be true. But uh, ultimately, sometimes if you don't think about it, you just have to accept it on pragmatic reasoning. Well, you just sort of have to work with what you think is true. <laughs> you have no real justification, so it's just assumed. Yeah. And uh, that's actually typically used in presuppositional apologetics against uh, some naturalist and atheist and so on, where if they can't even justify experience, uh, the uniformity of nature is typically how it's put, and uh, many other things as well. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, Jeff, Jeff Durbin, I think he does that with the uniformity of nature, but uh, Greg Bonson and uh, Van Til... Pre-sub apologetics is the stuff I like, but uh, the Saiten Bruden Kate is where it's butchered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you ever see the uh, Jeff Durbin memes? And it's like, you know, guys with beards like this have a 125% chance of asking you uh, on what basis do you say that? And it's like... <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have to share one on Facebook now. But I think there's, uh, I would argue at least that there's one word type of knowledge or category of knowledge would be, like, procedural knowledge. You could maybe put it in a, you know, propositional language, I guess, as in yeah. statements that can be true or false. But at the same time, when you intuit how you know it, you just don't learn it through inductive or, well, sort of inductive reasoning, but deductive reasoning where you put it in this argument form. I don't think you learn things that way, and that's procedural knowledge. You know, like learning, well, how, yeah. learning how to ride a bike, you just learn it by r practicing it and so on it's not like you think about it if you yeah yeah that, that's it, almost i mean that, that's almost in the realm of of psychology you know and i think i think a neurologist would say well that's a cerebellum when, when you have tasks that are that are so kind of rote that you don't want them occupying the forefront of them of your mind you know you just kind of put the, put it in that kind of uh you know that kind of procedural knowledge where where you know you know, you can you can think about other things at, in terms of propositional claims while, while you're riding your bike, but yeah, but yeah, I, I do I do think it, it goes back to the the kind of uh, uh, knowledge uh, versus familiarity uh, as as two kind of different classes, and yeah, that that, that knowledge as we we're saying it is that kind of you know propositional uh, uh, knowledge of 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 propositional truth claims. Yeah, I, I think propositional truth claims would be things like, you know, mathematics, which is purely inductive. Uh, logic itself, just deductive reasoning. And then uh, liberal arts, as in the well, sense of uh, learning a little bit of everything, which... Uh, not, math not, mathematics is, is partly inductive, but yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the subjects of knowledge that you learn in college and, you know, school and so on, history, uh, science yeah. and so on. Now, you you obviously don't have full certainty of those topics, but with math and deductive reasoning, 
things that are almost necessary, if not necessary, like the laws of logic, you have more certainty than not. But I think you can still apply justified true belief in those categories. Uh, Interestingly, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, uh, if if you define mathematics as proof making, uh, then then uh, geometry is really the only true mathematics that a high school graduate has actually taken, because it's it's only uh, in geometry class that you actually start from axioms and, and and produce proofs. At least at least for you know your average math student in high school, and so. You can say that 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 mathematical proof making is a is a kind of procedural knowledge. It's not it's not a, a, a you know there there are truth claims involved, but but you have to use a procedure to to get even more truth claims. So it's 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 you know a, a whole bunch of things uh, uh, put together. Hmm, that's actually very interesting to, to think about. the The highest math I ended up taking was trigonometry. That's why I yeah. wanted to be like an aerospace engineer, but after you know taking that class, I was just like, nah, I think I'll do something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, would trigonometry do the same? Because well, trigonometry. Yeah, well, trigonometry. yeah. Uh, I was thinking about that. Yeah, as long as as uh, you're you're producing proofs and you can you can prove like uh, uh, how to you know bisect an angle or whatever or or figure it out on your own. Yeah, that that would be that would be mathematics proper, I think, as a, as opposed to just arithmetic or analysis, or algebra, or would arithmetic be algebra? Uh, yeah, that again, again, I, I mean, I mean that algebra is is its own thing. Calculus is 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 simply analysis. You know, you know, you're evaluating integrals or whatever. But yeah, according to some definitions, actual mathematics. Is is the is creating proofs from from uh, axioms? So yeah, that would be a procedure. Hmm. And, 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 and to be and in honesty, uh, producing a mathematical proof requires a good bit of intuition. It's almost like like an artistic sense. Well, you know the the size of a triangle equaling one eighty degree angles and so on, and always being two yeah. sides. Uh, that's Planet Goes Reformed Epistemology, where that's a properly basic belief, and I think he's just defining that as immediate knowledge, uh, a.k.a. intuition, and that's sort of where the axioms begin. Well, th that actually can be proven. Maybe you have to go back to the to the uh, Euler's axiom. Um, I mean, yeah, the, the Euclidean uh, axioms to uh, to get to true, true, kind of inductive to true uh, intuitional uh Claims, but even those, again, we have to bracket them. I, I mean, yeah, uh, uh, those, those Euclidean uh, axioms are true within a certain context, and then as time goes on, uh, we gain a a knowledge of of the broader context in which you know that might be true and might not be true. And I, this is a problem I often see with atheists: is that they have the kind of a chronological chauvinism. Where they would say, "Oh, well, you know, you know what Newton says is, is has been disproven because he just he just got uh, 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 you know blown out the window by uh, by Einstein," and said, so, "Well, okay, well Einstein says that everything that Newton says is wrong. No, that's actually false. That's not true. Well, what what Einstein's what Einstein's uh, field equations did was take was take Newtonian mechanics and put that in a certain context." So we could say it's true within that certain context, but there's this whole other range of context where where that would not be sufficient. Just like the uh, Euclidean geometry, it's true for a flat plane. It's not true for for a curved surface. So yeah, so so I, and that's the way that knowledge seems to progress to me. Is not that we learn that that what we previously believed was false, just that it's true in a narrower context. That, than we might have thought. Well, I think another good example, if I'm following you, would be, you know, history. I think atheists apply uh, standards that apply to other contexts and not the context of history. Yeah. Especially yeah. When, when the Gospels, these are treated as historical documents, not comic book uh, characters like they, they will cite like Marvel and stuff like that when they make that category error. Yeah, of course, of course. 
and uh, you know, by almost deductive reasoning, <laughs> you know, uh, genres typically are two different contexts uh, for grammatical and literary use, and when you realize that, oh, you treat the Bible with, well, obviously more respect as an ancient document and so on. I'm not, even, I'm not even talking about, you know, whether it's an inspired word of God, but just as a basic historical yeah. document. And a, a collection of writing over a thou, almost 2,000 years, not in one sitting or determined at the, you know, Council of Laodicea and so on. It's just a book. It's, <laughs> yes. it's they, they just call it a book as, a, as if it all just plopped from the sky in, in one piece, yeah. Well, if it did that, like, if it literally fell out of the sky, that would be... It, would be yeah, but, <laughs> then, 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 yeah, you could, you could say it, it, it came from God, so they, they wouldn't have anything to hide behind, yeah. But then it would be like, well, you believe, all your beliefs come from a book. <laughs> all yours do, too, bud. You know, if you ever went to high school or, you know, middle school, you learn things from books. That yeah. Really knowledge. Now, whether the knowledge oh, in the well, Bible is true is what is, is the question. Good. Yes. Yeah, show me the verse in the Bible where it says the only things contained in this book are true. <laughs> Try to find me that Bible verse. Oh uh, yes, it's in uh, the Gospel of Judas. Oh wait, my bad. No, it's, that's it's, not even it's, in there. Uh, it's in the empty notes. They they penciled it in in the in the notes section at the end. Yeah. 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 But we know Judas didn't write a gospel because he was hanging around other places. But you know. I always tell that joke. Whether it's morbid or people don't get it, there's always oh, silence. Yeah, there. okay, okay. That was a way homer, yeah. <laughs> I just heard it in a... Well, my Bible professors used it one time. I was just like, that's a weird... That's a weird uh, joke. And I just Christian threw it out Christian there. Gallows humor, yeah. To change the mood. <laughs> sometimes it works, and then sometimes people just don't even get it. Or they have to think about it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so to summarize, what I would argue are three types of knowledge or three categories of knowledge would be, you know, more, I mean, when I say epistemological, I don't mean knowing, because then that would just end up being circular, but more of uh, where you form these sort of uh, systems like scientism, uh, inductive reasoning, and so on, all these methodologies of finding, finding out how you know things. That would be sort of more of my uh, justified true belief camp, where you have mathematical truths in that context, you have historical truths in that context, and so on and so forth. Then, uh, you know, the relational knowledge where it's definitely not the same thing, because you can't justify, uh, you know, like, in justified true belief or propositional knowledge that I know deflating atheism as a friend or whatnot. That's just something we intuit or have immediate knowledge of. I think we could put qualia in that category too. Um, actually, what do you mean by qualia? Well, like I was saying before, like the color orange. You oh, know, okay. Like, okay. I know the color orange. Yeah. Or you know, do we see the same uh, color red? Is another thought experiment used? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you know, procedural knowledge, learning how to do things like bike riding or driving, and then uh, you just have that you know under your under your belt. Yeah, yeah. And you, that, 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 you you don't have to recite to know that stuff. It's just, now, obviously, it goes away if you don't practice stuff. You have to obviously retain and so on, but, you know, it's easier to do than certain knowledge claims. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, it would be impossible to relate to the world entirely in terms of, of knowledge claims. I mean, I mean that, would, that would be an impossibility. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, could you repeat that last statement? I sort of it would be possible for us to to uh, relate and interact with the world uh, uh, entirely in knowledge claims. Oh yeah, the propositional knowledge, and this is where yeah. I think relativism is very. Uh, how, what's the phrase? Uh, free lunches is that what's called? Where uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah, Tonstoffel. Yeah, where you uh, take things for granted and you sort of slip them into your own epistemology. Yes. And so on. Where uh, relativism wants to say that, you know, all truth claims are sort of just relative to the eye of the perceiver, but uh, they definitely take for granted procedural knowledge and relational knowledge. And uh, you can't yeah. really justify those things. And that's why I think they sort of same 
say, besides the things that we see with our senses, uh, you know, it, inductive reasoning and stuff, they, they take that for granted too because no one actually believes that the label on a bottle of rat poison is wrong. And and if people on college campuses actually believe that, then I, I think they should sue their college campuses. <laughs> well, uh, at the rate things are going, who knows what uh, crazy things people will be saying next month. So, uh, uh, yeah, you could maybe maybe not uh, count on that. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm practicing the principle of charity a little too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think everyone... And obviously, when people use their phones, they obviously believe that those will work, and that's a sort of objective and so on. Sort of first century millennials and a Generation Z, or is it X? I don't remember. People born from two thousand to yeah, that's Gen Z, yeah, Gen Z, and uh, they they take things for technological uses, even though the things you can actually have less certainty of than metaphysical principles like logic. Yes. Logic will definitely be seen as relative because to be a Hindu almost, you have to deny the laws of logic. And um, if relativism Whoa. says, huh? Well, okay. Well, from from what I understand, there is Hindu logic because uh, some of their beliefs are contradictory, like monism and stuff like that. Uh, I was listening to uh, RT, no reasons to believe, a two podcast series, and they were talking about. Do the laws of quantum mechanics uh, defy the laws of logic? And uh, people like Deepak Chopra, he, you know, his consciousness thing, and other people they were sort of talking about in this podcast will try and appeal to quantum mechanics to say, yeah, the laws of logic are broken here to almost justify some of their beliefs. And they were tying in Hinduism and uh, monism and stuff like that. Great. Yeah, well, they they, they use like a a non locality of particle uh, uh i think is the typical yeah. argument which which does not hold up and if you had a, a johan and rots here uh, i think you would have a lot to say about that so uh i i think he he he, he would claim that it certainly does not prove a, a relativism or, or that the laws of logic are, are inapplicable but it, uh, it would prove uh, idealism yeah i'm not an idealist but you know or at least I don't think I am. I might be based on my last conversation with inspiring philosophy. Yeah, I think you were talking about the split experiment. Uh, well, well, I yeah, well, that's the no, not the not the split experiment, but non-locality or, or that that a, a or, particle or, can have an undefined location oh, or, okay. or that two particles can be can a. Uh, uh, basically uh you know have, have quantum entanglement to basically be the same particle in two different places at once i'm not really an expert in that kind of stuff but yeah i, I have heard those kind of arguments broached and, and they they don't really they don't really uh uh seem to apply because it seems when people say oh well this means logic is broke what they're taking is their commonsensical view of the world that you know uh objects in space uh, have a fixed location uh, and they're trying to apply that to the quantum realm where it doesn't apply and so logic only seems to break if if you insist on forcing your common sense view of the world onto quantum mechanics where it no longer applies well, it's, I, it's, yeah. it's the common sense view of the world that's broken not logic yeah i think you're exactly right and that's a pretty good summary uh, the fact that we don't fully understand quantum mechanics because there's ten different yeah. interpretations, it seems like you can't really say that. Therefore, <laughs> the laws of logic are violated. <laughs> that, yeah, that would be a very drastic conclusion to to draw from that. And uh, I actually, you know, atheists who try and point that out to you know try and counter the tag argument, which basically yeah. argues the laws of logic point to. Oh, well, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not not to uh, uh, jump on to what you're saying, but didn't like Lauren was it Lawrence Krauss saying crazy stuff like that? I know Steve McRae uh, will try. Well, I know he used uh, tried to use a few examples from quantum mechanics. This was something I listened to a while back ago, but uh, he made yeah. change his mind. Or people on Twitter will do that. Sometimes even Christians might do that. Because I, I know one of my professors actually tried to do that, which sort of scared me. Um, yeah, well, War- Lawrence Krauss had the 2 plus 2 equals 5 uh, t-shirt. I don't know. But I, I didn't want to uh, uh, sidetrack you there. 
Yeah, no, no problem. But you know, some I, I know atheists will actually try and do that to counter the tag argument to appeal yeah. to quantum mechanics, where the laws of logic aren't prescriptive and just really were descriptive at one point, and now they're you know sort of false and they're not really rules we have to follow. Which, when you deny them, then you're saying that I can be right and you can be right at the same time. And your metaphysics, what is true, whatever reality is, can be two different realities that contradict each other, which. Relativism would seem to imply, since people can believe what they want, and that becomes their own truth in a, the sense of religious belief and their metaphysics, you know, whether God exists or what your definition of God is. Now, I think that bears many consequences, and uh, and yeah. I'm not doing an appeal to consequence, but rather, you know, because you accept this, your beliefs become contradictory and very inconsistent when you apply them to uh, relational knowledge and procedural knowledge. Well, I mean, I mean, the fact of the matter is, if I, I mean, again, I well, it, it's like we're we're again we're having this conversation as if anyone is is a a, a, a you consistent relativist, you know, and you're saying, well, no, they even they don't really uh, believe uh, in that all truth is relative. They only believe that some truth is relative, and so it's it's kind of hard to argue against the position where they're not even clearly stating their case. But the fact is, if someone believes that all, all knowledge, all truth is relative, then they really have no right to complain uh, for basically anything that happens. You know, I, 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 could, I could lock them in a, in a, in a torture dungeon or something, and they could say, why, why do you have me in this torture dungeon? I say, no, you're not. You know, it's like, what, 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 what proceeds from there? I mean, it's, it's, it's craziness. Yeah. It's I like, I, I, I have a right not to be in this dungeon. And I say, what? Is it making a Claim, I'm... Oh, you broke out there. Oh, I, I, I said, if they say, yo, I, I, you're violating my rights or something, I said, no, I'm not. There's no rights. I'm not even really here. So, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it just completely breaks down. Yeah, and, and, and what we're talking about, you know, and you sort of brought in some moral facts, I think. Yeah. But you're also saying maybe the person can believe that they're not there so they can't be held accountable and so on. Yeah. And that that could end up being true if the laws of logic are false, but yet if they're false, you're still presupposing something is true. And logic sort of presupposes... Yeah. Truth presupposes logic, actually. And uh, I think at that point, you your argument against logic... <laughs> yeah. Uh, which some atheists will literally try and argue against, which is funny, uh, presupposes it. Yeah, well, there, there, are, there are many logics. I, I, I mean, that's a whole field of, of study of, or various logics. But I think, like, William Lane Craig has, like, has like what is it, like, seven basic axioms that you cannot deny uh, without, without just total contradiction in your worldview. Yeah, and um, like example I I give is modal logic, like how things could have been. Uh, yeah, it, that well that would that would be a more that would be a more advanced uh, uh logic if 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 you could even tier them that way. But yeah, I'm talking about like the law of non uh contradiction and and basically you know you know yeah. basic syllogistic reasoning and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and then and then you get to propositional logic and and, and modal logic and and. and you know, various, uh, uh, you know, more, more mathematically sophisticated logics, fuzzy logic for that matter. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But they all presuppose the laws of logic, which is, and I would say all epistemolo all epistemologies do because uh, logic is the main branch. Well, one of the main branches that run metaphysics, your epistemology, axiology, study of the good and uh, yeah. many other things of wisdom. Well, they, they they all presuppose this core of of of, of you know uh, a lot logical laws, which which again I, I think I think William Lane Craig has them, so you could count them on two hands, and, and th those are really the things that that you really cannot deny and not have a completely insane uh, uh, you know incoherent worldview. I I, th I think you're right there, and uh, you know truth. Is that you know which corresponds to reality? I think the laws of logic will all, be, and actually, if we apply modal logic, you know, could things have been different? Which uh, of course presupposes truth and laws of logic and yeah, necessity. 
something has to be real. Like, there's no world in which things do not exist because yeah. things do not exist, and that is a world in it in and it of itself. But of course, that that becomes logically contradictory because it presupposes what it argues against. But I don't think people argue that. So what this world is is up for grabs in our limited knowledge, and that's why we have things as epistemology. If we if we had absolute certainty, and we knew we 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 know already what the actual truth is, what that is, reality is, uh, we would both mm. argue that's Christianity metaphysics. Christianity is the true metaphysics, basically. Yeah, but um, that that's what why we have all these different examples of knowledge and so on because we clearly, you know, I I find it funny. I'll I'll just bring in uh an example from apologetics here when atheists will argue, well, there's thirty five thousand different denominations. <laughs> How can you have a core point? How can Christianity be true and so on? Just like there are a ton of epistemologies. You could also maybe use this as a counter example to the three thousand gods argument. There are yeah. over a thousand epistemologies. How can there actually be knowledge, <laughs> since they all disagree on what knowledge is? the 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 point is that you know perhaps even though I think there are systems that you can tell are contradictory, but yet people hold to them anyway. But e even granting that perhaps it's all these systems are fuzzy and there's not one true system, they're all presupposing truth, just like all Christian denominations presuppose the Christian truth values, or, you know, the main tenets of Christianity, like Jesus rose from dead, of faith through works, and or faith through salvation, so on and so, so forth, all, all the solas probably. Because I mm -hmm. think even... uh. Orthodox and Catholicism sort of presuppose a uh, soli fide in a way, and maybe even sola scriptura, but that's a whole other conversation. Wow, well, yeah, you're getting into a minefield there, yeah. Yeah, um, that's not my field of expertise, but from what I understand from those, I think that uh, we can find common ground, and that's why I'm not like any... Well, 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 well sola scriptura uh, uh, actually runs into a logical problem of its own, because it, it, it's, it's a... <laughs> It's it's you know the these true claims can only come from the Bible, but the Bible itself does not make that claim. So I, I mean, I, I you don't could... think that's sola scriptura. I think sola okay, scriptura okay, would simplifying. say that when it comes to issues like salvation or main theological issues such as certiology, how we're saved, and so on, the Bible is the ultimate authority. Would you agree or disagree with that? Oh, I I I, I, I would not say that. No. So when it comes to issues of salvation, the Bible is not the main authority. Uh, I don't want to pressure you if you don't want to give an answer, but that, yeah. that, that's from my understanding. Well, that, well, well I'll, I'll say it's it's not self evidently true. I'll, I'll say that. Hmm. Because you know, yeah, this is a whole another conversation. Yeah, it is. It is in of itself. I would just say that I think it's clear that, you know, even though the church fathers, the earliest church fathers, like after the council and so on, when we get the canon, obviously the church fathers, I don't want to say they determined the canon, but obviously I think God used them to bring about yes, the canon. Yes. So that's why I think uh, the fourth century and back church fathers are extremely important, but yet they're also following a standard the canon itself, so they're sort of not determining it, but they're following it, which uh, I think Sola Scriptura would affirm that the canon is the ultimate authority, but at at the same time, the Church Fathers obviously had to almost guide guide that as well, and uh, which yeah. would also be, if we want to use it as an al another analogy for truth, then uh, th they would be presupposing that there, there would be this sort of truth in the canon, and that there is certain canon means standard so there is a standard they are following themselves just like as uh, knowledge knowers or truth seekers I think everyone even if they're inconsistent seeks truth in one of those three categories we mentioned before uh, they have to follow the standard I think the church fathers sort of followed a standard itself I don't think they determined it but rather were guided by the Holy Spirit and so on yeah and I think I think all three main you know, branches of uh, Christian denominations would ultimately agree with that. If that's the case, and I think we can f all find common ground there. But uh, I, getting back to you know the topic at hand. Oh, do do you have any any other comments? Oh, uh, geez, uh, I might have at one point. I'm, 
kind of we've kind of been all over the place. Well, I, I wanted to make like a really uh, silly. Uh, well, it's what atheists say is silly when they say that the laws of logic are are prescriptive uh, or, or descriptive rather than prescriptive, which is completely silly and says nothing at all. It's one of those kind of pseudo intellectual proclamations that doesn't really mean anything. Because the, the whole purpose of being descriptive is to describe something outside of itself. So I, I, I mean I mean they're not really they're not really making a, a very meaningful claim when they say the laws of logic are, are descriptive rather than prescriptive. Well then it could just follow that they're describing something that's prescriptive. <laughs> and then they end up in yeah. the same problem, I think. Exactly, exactly. But uh, what I also find funny is, uh, you know, they try and use uh, classical mechanics, which would be, you know, things are fixed in time and space, as you were mentioning before, and, you know, s assuming the uniformity of nature to argue against miracles. But but then when you go into quantum mechanics, that yeah. stuff almost seems miraculous by uh, definition because it violates, you know, classical mechanics, which if you want to find uh, miracles as that which goes against the laws of nature... Uh, you, you 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 don't even have to go that far. Uh, I, I mean I mean to my mind, uh, if we assume the atheistic naturalistic worldview, we have uh, basically everything in the entire universe, uh, uh, from galaxies down to uh, uh, you know subatomic uh, particles, all observing these very predictable laws for no reason at all. They all behave in very predictable ways for for no absolute absolute reason at all and uh, uh and they keep existing in time for no reason at all that seems like the miracle to me not not that there would be a, a temporary suspension of, of of the of the uh you know natural laws of the world the fact that they all observe these laws in the first place would seem like the miracle of miracles well that that's actually uh my argument against hume's Objection, you know, you should believe what uh, you're more certain of and, you know, bet towards that, which would be the uniformity of nature, which yeah. would presuppose the, the laws of nature, which they would always say are descriptive, but then then it follows miracles are possible because their well, description is just... Hume, Hume would not have said that nonsense about about uh, the laws of... <laughs> the oh, laws no, no, of he, he wouldn't. But uh, we're, we're talking about more miracles here. I basically yeah. argue the fine-tuning argument, if it's the case, then uh, it would be a, almost a proof, well, I think it would be a deductive proof against his argument, since uh, yeah. priest, since God is necessary, the necessary conditions, you would you could say, for the laws of nature being the way they are in fine-tuning and so on, and being a constant. Well, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut oh, you no, off. No good. Uh, I'm finished. I, I just think it's funny where where just the plain facts of existence, you know, atheists always make these these arguments from incredulity. You know, they say, oh, are you really saying that, you know, God intervenes in the world? Oh, are you really saying this? But when we just take the, the actual scientific facts of the world, they completely explode uh, the atheistic incredulity. Now... Now, you know, I am not, like, a young Earth creationist. But, I will say this, in favor of the young Earth creationist, it seems more plausible to me that all of the animals of the Earth basically came into existence fully formed in one instant, you know, effectively one instant. Uh, that seems more likely to me than uh, the universe has all these, you know, uh, constants that are fine-tuned to a degree of uh, 10 to the 120th power. It, it, you, you cannot say, oh, well, do you really believe that all animals came into existence at once? Yeah, actually, that, that possibility is much more probable than, than a, a, a perfectly finely tuned you know, a universe being perfectly finely tuned for no reason at all. So yeah, I, I really think that the, the atheist uh, arguments from incredulity are really laughable. And like I said, as I said before, about all the particles of the universe observing these predictable natural laws for no reason at all uh, certainly seems like like the biggest magic trick of them all. And uh, very convenient. <laughs> yes, yes. And I, I guess we could say we could say that they're using what's what's familiar to them, is that they simply take the laws of 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 nature for granted 
So it doesn't seem at all uh, remarkable to them, even, even if it doesn't really hold up logical muster that, that, you know, what we take for granted isn't any more probable than, than uh, other scenarios. Interesting stuff. But uh, let's continue more on truth, since, the, you know, there really isn't anything as truth anyway, but, you know, this is just more of a just, you know, sit down discussion. No, I'm kidding, but that's just my humor. Yes. I guess you don't share it, but... Uh, I, I, I'm I'm actually not a human being. I'm radiant face brain that's just, you know, putting out pulses in here, so yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think I, I think actually on some atheist views, or naturalist views, if they, if they want to be nitpicky with the definition of atheism, we really would just be two brains with chemicals just... Uh, argue yeah. back and forth with each other since they don't believe in the soul and so on. <laughs> or yeah, the thinking thing. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I mean that, that's a tricky thing because because uh, there there's electricity going off in my brain that somehow excites my lungs and it creates sounds and then those sounds go into electricity somehow that it ignites a, a, a completely physical reaction. That we are, we have air and electricity and sounds and, and, and electric charges and so we could describe this uh, in, entirely in physical terms, but at the same time, on top of that, we're having an exchange of ideas where I say an idea with words and those ideas excite thoughts, uh, and so we we have like two layers of causality where we can't even draw a one to one correlation, you know. So I, I think the, the kind of physicalist way of, of looking at things uh, is really poor. Because, yeah, I mean, we, we, we do have a determinism because I'm putting ideas into your mind and you're putting ideas into my mind. And so we can, we can analyze cause and effect that way, but we can't put that into any sort of one-to-one -one correlation uh, to, to, the, to the physical uh, causal processes of, of electricity and air and, and, you know, all those things uh, without just completely begging the question. Say, well, well, yeah, it is because, you know, uh, all thoughts all thoughts are material, so therefore, you know, QED. Well, um, that I, would be begging the question. Yeah, I, I think that's sort of Descartes, uh, even I don't know if he had this in mind, but I think you can imply his uh, I doubt, therefore I am uh, as sort of a defeater to almost uh, physicalism. Because yeah, yeah. the, the one thing you know with absolute certainty is that you are a thinking thing, and the physical stuff that makes your ontology can be doubted, but yet your mind can't, and yet physicalists want to argue against that. Yeah, they, 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 that they want to, to put the it. mind, they want to take the mind, which is certain, and make it subservient to the, uh, to the physical world, which is uncertain, which is completely upside down. And, and I know there are philosophers who have stated that much better than I, than I have, but yeah, it, it's like why why would I take my my mind and, and say, oh, this is only operating in in the world of the physical, where I can't make any uh, determining uh, truth claims about the physical world at all, but I can I can say with absolute certainty that my mind exists. So how am I saying that this is merely uh, uh, operating within the realm of that physical world? I can't even be sure of. It's completely nonsensical. It's like a scientifically, it's like trying to apply the scientific method to epistemology. <laughs> to yeah, determine what yeah. Our, epistemology happens in the mind and our thoughts, which are mental by definition, I think. Uh, even some, well, oh, not substance dualist, because that's what, that's what we would be, since I think we both hold the both mind and body makeup people's ontology but uh i forget what it's called it's another type of dualism where it's sort of a naturalist view that accepts uh mental states oh, uh, oh uh, be brain states well uh, yeah what they say, but, uh, it's an, oh, it's an emergent yeah property dualism i think it is okay uh, yeah or, 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 or physical states but yet aren't the physical states themselves which is a little bit more harder to combat but at the same time uh it's I think substance dualism explains the relationship between this uh, very self-evident truth, this uh, yes. very intuitive truth, 
this very uh, almost relational truth. It seems like uh, that that interacts with the physical world and so on. I, I think that best explain explains man's ontology and uh, truth itself when it comes to you know physicalism versus the soul and so on. The whole that whole debate. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I sort of talked about man's ontology, and I like uh, Anselm's, Anselm's definition of defining uh, a thing's final, sort of uh, a thing's highest truth, which Aquinas would describe as a thing's final form, and God yeah. knows all final forms and potential forms. And actually, yeah. I think I have an article coming out on that soon, but uh, Anselm well, calls this... Oh, good. Go, no good. Well, I'm just going to say, what does Anselm say? Yeah, and some calls this rectitude, or uh, something that is signified as, or a, signif- a signification of something's essence, or the correct statement of that. So, it's true that man is an animal, but it's not true that man is not only an animal. And it's also not true that man is a stone. Those are two simple examples he gives in his book on truth, which uh, I I use for an article from Anselm's greatest yeah, Anselm of Canterbury, the major works, great book. I also have one with Aquinas where it has most of his major works and so on. Mm, mm. But uh, I I like this idea. It, it's basically uh when you have the right truth proposition of a thing's ontology. So like God's sort of rectitude. Uh, I I think we don't fully understand the rectitude of God, obviously, because we don't have full knowledge of God, so we can't know His highest truth. But, uh, you know, when, yes. when Anselm and Plantinga define God as, you know, a masculine great being, grace, conceivable being, or that which nothing greater can be conceived, that yeah. would be the highest truth. And that, whatever that is, would have the highest ontology and therefore have the highest rectitude. And uh, I, I, I like uh, how well, he, 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 Yeah, even that seems like, like, a, like, a, like a, a propositional claim that, that almost... Uh, it almost seems too big to wrap your hands around. That's, uh, have you ever heard of like negative theology? It's like, we, we can only make negative yeah. claims yeah, about we, God. We, yeah. That's, that's actually very relevant, uh, relevant to my class. That I, you know, did this, this article and paper for, but, uh, we basically had, a per professor of philosophy come and he acted as, uh, a skeptic. He was pretty good at better than skeptics themselves, which I laugh at, but <laughs> <laughs> and uh he 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 asked the question, uh, can you give me a positive uh definition of God? And no one could do it and you could only define God as what like immaterial or, or, or timeless. Yeah, or, you can't or... really uh you can't really define something as you know, the common sense approach at least. It's very hard to to f- get a definition of immaterial. That's why it can be a category error sometimes when atheists ask yeah. how questions about God. But yet, yeah. you, the the logical conclusion would be that there would be something immaterial. You don't rely on your own incredulity. You uh, go with what is literally most logical, and uh, you know. So, and that's uh, very Thomistic thinking. From what I understand, is we know God from what He's not. Yeah. And, uh, well, no, well, yeah, we, 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 no, I, I don't think, to, uh, I don't, I don't think Thomas Aquinas, what was it, was a negative theologian. Maybe, maybe, uh, you know, negative theology takes, takes some elements from his thinking, but I, I have kind of like a cursory knowledge of it, but it seems to be like very big in, in, in continental philosophy. But what kind of my, my point I was getting at, is I, I think you and I would would both agree with this claim that like God is, is too big to be understood in his entirety. Yeah, and uh, I, I I agree with you, and that's almost uh, knowing God with full, you know, pause. pause well, the rectitude is what I was trying to get at. Yeah, yeah, I, I I I get that rectitude, but uh, I but, I think oh good. Well, no, th- this is my point. So, so the totality of God, in- insofar as God can even be talked about as a, as a totality, uh, it simply exceeds our imagination. Uh, but I, I agree. But, I think Anselm 
I don't like Anselm's uh, ontological argument that much. I think it was yeah. for the time, but, you know, he says it's conceivable to think of that which nothing greater can be conceived, but it almost seems like you're saying we can fully understand God. I don't think he would say that, because... Uh, oh, no, no be, I, I don't think so, and it, it, goes, it goes to my second point. It goes to my second point. It, it goes back to this distinction between, uh, like, knowing something in a the, in the sense of familiarity... And knowing something as as a as a propositional truth claim. Now, th- this is this was going to be my point: is that yes, God in His totality exceeds our ability to imagine Him, but that does not mean we cannot make uh, true or false truth claims about Him, demonstrably true or false. We can make true claims about God, even if God in His totality exceeds our ability to conceive Him. I I completely agree, and. Uh, to put it a more simple way, just because we don't have absolute certainty of all of God's nature and so on, we don't fully understand God, doesn't... Uh, it's almost a fallacy from division where uh, you argue from... You make... You argue from whole to parts where uh, you fully... Yeah. You, you don't yeah. fully understand God, therefore you can't fully understand anything about God, and that's... Exactly, a exactly. Fallacy. That's a great way of putting it, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, omnipotence, I think... That's you. You can't really understand what it means to be omnipotent, and that's that's actually almost another type of knowledge that you can't really put in propositional uh, language mm. because y- you you don't know what it feels like to be me, and I don't yeah. know what it feels like to be you. But at the same time, I, I know you, and I don't have to yeah. know what it's like to be you to know you, sort of. But you yeah. can understand what omnipotence is, generally speaking, with a pretty good certainty by with the you know definitions and so on. Yes, yes. So, so I, yeah. I, I think that's the best way to put it. But you know, with Christianity, I, I I do think there are some positive claims about God, like He's very relational, and uh, that that one category of knowledge, relational knowledge, and the Bible in special revelation, God reveals much. In a positive way, not in a negative way that natural theology typically does. Yes, uh, yes. That's why I think I think uh, we we understand more truth of God through special revelation over natural revelation. But at the same time, both are equally important. Yes, yes. I I, I agree, and and that I I mean uh, for me, uh, that is that is always kind of like. Mm, that that to me really comes through is just that immediate wa- awareness of God's existence rather than some sort of you know intellectual proposition. But you know what yeah you know, whatever works for you you know. Well, I think that immediate by immediate experience, do you mean like the Holy Spirit and stuff? How Craig talked about? Yeah, yeah, or or or, or just seeing like God in nature, or whatever, or just seeing design or, or anything, you know. Well, aesthetical truths and uh, moral truths are definitely intuition. And, uh, yeah. you know, aesthetical truths would be from things rectitude almost, uh, where you realize something's ontology and beauty comes about from that, I think. And I think uh, that I won't say atheists deny aesthetical truths, but rather they that's where relativism really plays into that these truths are sort of just subjective. But I think everyone yeah. sees. Uh, you know, April. What what what's the phrase? Uh, April flowers bring May shows. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, on, on the on the atheist worldview, which is well, it just you know, tickles their brain in a certain way that's pleasurable. Yeah. So that's their very reductive view of beauty. But in the view of you know Christianity, it's a, a design. It actually yeah. has rectitude. It has purpose and so on. And I think we have the capacity, even in our brains, to recognize. That something is more beautiful, like uh, when the first day of spring or whatnot, or when you know you see the flower blooms versus uh, yeah, something like uh, maggots and so on. That's obviously there's, <laughs> there's an argument from beauty, and uh, that's typically I don't use that because you get nowhere with some people because I think relativism is such a problem. I don't think people are going to accept the premise that objective uh, beauty exists, but um. Because it's not as tangible as uh, some other arguments are, but I think it could still be an argument user, the argument from desire. I, I think, agreed. 
Yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it, it's it's uh, very similar to, to moral truths, you know, and, and it's just, you know, moral truths uh, more frequently uh, comes to blows, obviously, because people have, have competing self-interests. So that seemed like more of an urgent topic. But I, I really do think you can class uh, those those moral truths alongside uh, aesthetic truths. I wonder... Would this be in? I'm trying to think of what category of knowledge I would want to place this in, or maybe it's its own category. It's obviously immediate knowledge. Yeah. So it's not just you know the propositional where you have to a posteriori uh, justify it, like in mathematics and so on. Well, mathematics would be a priori, a priori reasoning, but yet you can also uh, a posteriori <laughs> justify it when you you know solve it and then recheck it and so on. <laughs> what? Oh, okay, TMM. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, sorry about that. There was, there was that, that was that, completely uh, that was completely unwarranted. I would, yeah, I would that, not. That's uncalled for. That's an insult. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> uh, I think he butchers the terms. And I think he also uh, just butchers philosophy and yeah, and makes me not want to be a lover of wisdom. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's just a philosophical way of putting it. Yes, I. I I guess maybe it would be. It's obviously in rectitude. Maybe maybe it is somehow a, rel, a relational way. Maybe it's a relational way of knowing God, perhaps from the a Christian worldview. Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, uh, as far as aesthetics is concerned, I, I I think it is it is a a point of communion uh, between between creator and created. You know, and that that, that can work for for the beauty of the natural world or the beauty of artistic creation. So, since God created us in His image as creators, so I, I really think it's 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 a point of communion between us and God uh, in e- in either case. I I think you're especially right. I think that's sort of what Romans one, uh, not when it starts talking about judgment of the Gentiles, where it splits about uh, another group, but talking about you know how everyone everyone sort of knows. The creator from the creation and so on. Yes. And uh, saw it in Psalms, what is one nineteen? Yes, and they were they were without excuse. Yeah. Well, that that would be uh, Romans one, but uh, you know the heavens declare the declare yeah. the glory of God and so on. I think that's Psalm one nineteen. I may be wrong on top of my head. I intuit it, but you know that is an intuition <laughs> that can be wrong. But uh, you know. I think that sums up. Uh, oh, I, I I like the Augustinian sort of a Christian definition of truth. Well, that all truth is God's truth because all things rectitude, recti, rectitudes come from God, since you know God would be the designer and so on. Yeah. Uh, now, an atheist may object to me like, well. Then it then wouldn't everything be relative based on God's creation? But you can just say, well, no, because things are would be objective in another way. In in modal logic, you know, this is a possible world. God could have created the world a different way, but it's a possibility. While in relativism, things uh things that are contradictory becomes become possibilities. Even though logically you can't have that, while God could have created differently. That was just something. I thought of on, on the top of my head that I, I think an atheist would possibly argue, but uh, you know, do you think an atheist would argue that maybe? Well, I I, I don't think I know exactly what you're getting at. It's uh, uh the kind of thing is, is it moral because God wills it, or is it moral just because you know, you know, yeah, uh, is, or we could maybe phrase it: is it true because God is a thing's rectitude? that because God wills it or because, uh, you know, it's... Yeah, well, like, arbitrary whim, you know? Yeah, yeah, something something like that. But I, I, at the same time, I think God can create ontology how he wants to, but at the same time, uh, I'm not going to say God is bound, but I think God has... Or I don't want to say bound or restrictions, but I think logically there are just worlds in which that don't exist like god can't create a square circle because it's not a yeah. thing so god can't be bound by things that aren't really things but rather he has maximum freedom to create whatever he wants just as long as it doesn't go against his nature so obviously god can't 
lie and so on. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, I think the the error come from I was thinking of of the laws of logic as as something separate from God, yeah. you know, so as some and, sort and of a scaffolding yeah. under which he, he operates. Yeah, Rather, which I think the, the tag error- would argue they're like conceptual by nature, so they have to be grounded in a mind, and then that eternal mind would be God. So they, yeah. in a way, co-eternally exist, so they would either be part of his nature or result from the mind, but at the same time simultaneously exist with the Logos or the eternal mind. But, uh, well, if, if my IQ was about you know four times what it was, four hundred times what it is right now, I'd I'd sum up that whole issue and, and tie it up in a bow for you. But unfortunately, uh, I don't. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. It is what. Yeah, I, I've, actually, I've actually I've uh, actually heard uh, uh, people object to to uh, logical arguments. And it goes back to what we were talking about before. They they object to to uh, logical arguments for God's existence by saying that we're, we're placing the laws of logic above God, which again, I think is the wrong way of looking at it. We're, we're using the laws of logic to make true uh, claims about God, to, to demonstrate true claims about God. We're not, God is not, you know, hanging from the scaffolding of the laws of logic. He's not, God does not exist because of the laws of logic. Uh, uh, but we can use logic to make true claims about God. Yeah, and you, do you kind of understand what oh, I was saying? Yeah, no, I, I understand because when I have when I have these uh, conversations with my fellow student min majors who aren't philosophy majors, I'll add in. Yeah. They always they always say, "Well, aren't you holding God, or aren't you idolize?" Like my one friend was trying to get me to admit that I idolized logic above God. I kept trying to tell him. I sort of view logic as almost a part of God's mind and therefore exactly. part of nature. So in a way, I'm idolizing God, I guess. Sure, I idolize logic since it almost is. I don't want to say logic is God, but it's sort of an attribute of God, you could say. Yeah. Agreed. It is an aspect of God, yeah. Yep, just like... uh. Now, if however you want to put that in divine simplicity, if you want to go the, meta, the, the Thomas route... But yeah. that, that divine simplicity is a whole another thing. I, I ultimately, I think I do accept divine simplicity. I just think, uh, I think when Thomas say that, uh, because they were object to Molinism, if you know that what that is on top of your head, they're say that well, if God has this knowledge of other worlds and possible worlds and so on, even though that may not be the right way of phrasing it, how they do sometimes that that somehow becomes a part of God. And uh, yeah. since God w- God would know from God knows all things from His essence or nature, which would be uh, the whole simple part, and God's knowledge would be simple in that case. But if God has knowledge of things that are possible from that are grounded in free creatures, you could say that somehow becomes a part. But uh, I'm actually writing an article where. I'm actually arguing that the Thomistic sense of divine simplicity, or at least how the Thomas Aquinas, Tom, Thomas Aquinas viewed God's knowledge, is very compatible with Molinism. Yeah, yeah, it seems to me. But yeah, I'm not. I'm really not familiar with that argument. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, a quick counterexample, even though this is really off the topic, um, would be the pro evil. How does God know evil? Because evil is not part of God's nature. But if God can only know what he knows, God knows from what he knows from himself, you could say, or from his essence. Evil is obviously not part of his essence. There go and say, well, God knows, God knows uh, evil from his essence in the way that he knows the good, so he knows what results from that, but then I have counter-arguments for, well, if God knows his image bearers, because they're made in the image of God, then he knows what those things are rectitude, uh, and all all potential, all potential. That's actually very important for uh, you know, Thomistic talk. Talk. Yeah. Actual and actual. Well, God knows all potential free choices, but of course He knows the actual choices, which is very Molin, Molinistic. And I think Thomists make make this mistake if they argue. If I'm understanding their position correctly, and Thomas Aquinas, which I think I do, but. If that is well, it, it seems to me that the that the whole or, that the whole question is built on the false premise because I don't know of any like orthodox uh, interpretation of Christianity that does not view 
the world as, as separate and other than God. So, I mean, well, what you're saying is that, like, God can only know things of, of his own essence almost seems like like a like gnosticism or something well, because because the world the world the, the world is separate from god yeah i i think that's actually interesting too or then you run into the problem of fatalism where that, that's the whole thing about fallenness is that yeah we do know we do know that the 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 world is other than god and, and that you know we're not it's not the the world is not you know sacred in the way maybe you know the pagans thought or something I think that that's a very interesting uh, objection there, but uh, perhaps they mean something else. But from yeah. uh, when I when I Matt Slick, if you know him, he yeah uh, sort of threw that objection to me against Molinism at the time. I didn't quite understand divine simplicity, even though I think I had decent uh, responses and so on. I still want to upload that like half hour clip, but uh, I may or may not. But you know. Uh, maybe I'll go back on his uh, Thursday night live streams and present that to him. But uh, what's funny is he holds to the tag argument, which uh, he he argues that logic, the laws of logic, are a part of God or part of God's nature. Which, if that's the case, you have to reject divine simplicity because then that becomes a part of God, and uh, God would not be simple in the metaphysical sense if they won't hold knowledge claims as actual parts. And I don't think propositions are parts. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, again, you know, you you can phrase that in a different way. You could say it's it's an aspect of God or something, you know, or it's a description of God. Which, if if they go that route, then I agree. Propositions are just descriptions, generally speaking. But uh, uh do you have any like last minute thoughts or questions or maybe uh objections to anything I've said? No, no, <laughs> I object to everything you say. <laughs> well, it's because I'm a theist, obviously. So you know, a religious hard. No, we 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 joke around here, but yes, yes, uh, uh, and, and and fall back into into uh, uh, athe basically satirizing atheotards. Yeah, and, it's, uh, it's very very easy comedy. By that term, uh, I mean typical atheist commenters. Uh, not yeah. not like people like Sirs and so on. Sirs is cool. I like Cyrus, yeah. Yeah, he, he helps me with my tech <laughs> issues. So uh, <laughs> that's how I think theists and atheists can get along is uh, solving each other's well, tech why issues. Don't you just, why don't you just pray to God to fix your computer? <laughs> that would be an objection. By No, that would be a, an atheist comment. That seriously <laughs> would be. I, I actually want to do a video compilation of uh, just responding to stupid atheist comments. Yes. On oh, my... man. I've, I've gotten some doozies recently. Oh, hey, if you want to be a part of that, then I'll definitely... Uh, please, please. It won't be a live stream. It'll just be pre-recorded because of how I have to, you know, list the comments. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I, I, well, I have this program called Snagit, and just literally you highlight a part of your screen that you want cut into a photo, and it does that. So I've been doing that with a bunch of atheist comments. So yeah, from my channels or just really stupid ones I've come across, where it's just like, oh my goodness, you you lack rectitude. <laughs> <laughs> you got served. Oh yeah, I mean, obviously the the atheist in the comment section uh, serves the one who makes the video and so so on. You know, they'll they'll be blasted backwards, uh, toppling over their gaming chair. <laughs> you lack rectitude. And like, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that uh, that's gonna be my new uh, insult. You lack rectitude. <laughs> I am disturbed by your lack of rectitude. <laughs> okay, I think I, I think I think we've we've had our fun. Yeah, I think we have too. Um, a book suggestion I would have for a layman breakdown of this sort of uh, what we've been talking about. Because they won't use much philosophical terms like we've been using is uh, the book I was actually referencing, I think, a little earlier. Uh, Relativism by Francis J. Beckworth with and uh, Gregory Kokel, who I think we all know who Gregory Kokel is. I don't know who Francis is, but uh, they they write on, you know, the truth relativism and moral relativism. But uh, that that's a great book. I'll leave a link in, in the description. So uh, any last minute thoughts? No, I, I enjoyed this. I thought it was a very interesting. Cool. I, I definitely think the same thing. Uh, do you have anything you want to plug? 
Uh, no, uh, hopefully I'll have some, uh, videos going up soon on, on deflating atheism, uh, and, and please be patient because I'm going through some, some personal difficulties in my life, but I'll be back on deflating atheism. Uh, cool, I hope you resolve those personal issues. Okay, I can use some prayers, yeah. Yeah. For, for my father, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think you were telling me about that on Facebook. Yeah. But, uh... Yeah, thanks for coming on and discussing this. Well, if, no if I ended up doing this by myself, it would be probably a little bit more boring or a lot shorter. <laughs> That's fine. I, I, I just had to not curse. Though. That's the one thing, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I honestly... You know, Usually it's just like a stream of profanity, you know? It's like, jeez. <laughs> just hey. a nonstop stream of profanity, but I, I try to rein it, you know? Well, it just really depends on, like, the, the Hangout streams. Um, yeah. Like, you know, your subscriber specials, those are, you know, storms of <laughs> cursing and so on. I, honestly, I I tried to avoid it just because, scientifically, I don't think it is healthy. Yeah. And, uh, the conversations, like, real conversations go so well when you just avoid, you know, profanity. And I think when uh, wanting to love wisdom, you have to avoid... Words that are, first of all, I think just pragmatically useless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, probably immoral too, but you know, that's just my uh, stuff on that, but you know. Yeah, it's, well, well, don't become a utilitarian. <laughs> I mean, that's how my epistemology works, so you know, not actually wisdom, just everything is based on pragmatic value. Yeah, yeah. We've been fooling you the whole time. We're just, uh, I almost said Unitarians. <laughs> which would uh, view that. Utilitarians, as yeah. One person and one being, not three persons and one being. Or one in essence, I guess. Well, no, tr Trinitarians hold that God is one in essence. But besides. I, I, I think Unitarians are their own form of relativists because I, I don't think you can nail down their belief system to any one thing. <laughs> it's like, eh, maybe this is true, maybe not, you know. Well, let's let's get together and like eat casseroles. I don't, I don't even know what the, I don't even know what they do in, in Universalist churches, <laughs> Unitarian churches. You, they're Unitarian Universalists, yes, which which well, tell, tells me everything and nothing. You know what? When when Protestants bash on the Eastern Orthodox and Catholicism, now I think there are some things in Roman Catholicism where I completely agree with that. Like I think the papacy is almost heresy, in my own opinion. Um, like, do you like Pope Francis? I, I, I'm having severe reservations. Point. But I, I'm, I'm not. I don't. I've kind of tuned out of of the news. I'm not even following that stuff because it got it got really upsetting to me a few months ago. So yeah, if I see like a news article about something from from the Vatican, I I just probably won't read it. You know. Yeah. But um, you know, Unitarians almost attract attack one of the main core points of the gospel because I think the gospel just falls apart when you get rid of the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah, and yeah. Eastern Orthodox and Catholicism holds to that while, you know, Islam denies that, Mormonism denies that, Jehovah's mm. Witnesses deny that because they denied the divinity of Christ from my understanding and, uh, and other cults Jeez. and uh, sects that are not Christian but yet atheists want to argue are Christian. But yeah. then, but then you realize their lack of church history, the lack of rectitude. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually didn't realize how bad the Jehovah's were until until very recently. Yeah, how bad the what was you cut out there? Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh yeah, I I think it's pretty bad. But yeah, one time they they came to my doorstep and uh, my dash on bit one of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well he has that intuition. <laughs> he knows how to sense demons. He knows he knows bad theology. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think I think we do need to wrap it up. Yeah, I think we went on a few rants, but you know that's yeah. that what that's what makes these podcasts more interesting to listen to. Right. It's not just pure facts he, and information, but rather fun discourse and he he the, you, he's very your dash on very correct in his dogma. Do you get it? His dogma. Since we're on dog jokes, uh, why are uh, dogs better than cats? Why? 
because uh, God spelled backwards is dog, so. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Deep we'll, be, we'll, argument. We'll, we'll be here all week. We'll be here all week, folks. We'll be here all year and uh, yeah. for the T- rest tip of your eternity. Wages. Okay. Have a good night, folks. <laughs> God bless. Yep, uh, if you want to support the channel, there will be a Patreon link in the description. If you want to support the flaying atheism, I think you also have a Patreon. Have a good night. Yep, God bless everyone.